All right, so returning to our, our underpainting here and doing some more kind of targeted painting on top. Now this is gonna require a lot of energy, this kind of work I'm doing. I'm doing it at, at an 80% opacity with still a pretty large brush. Not 90% anymore, 80% and working over the top of the underpainting I already have, which is there. And you can see we start to shape and make a difference. Now, it's been a while since I've worked on this, since the last demo. So to warm up, I might choose to make a new layer. And I might choose to bring in some additional reference. So I have all this different reference. Some of it's pretty extreme. Um, I really like some of these color choices. I might throw this one into this window. Oops, that's not going to work. So let's open that up with Photoshop. In order to be able to steal colors from a source, you have to have it open within Photoshop. See, and since I clicked on that, that will put it in that window. I can shrink it down and kind of move it. And then I can move back and forth. I also like this one, which is really yellow. Kind of push the overall color scheme a little away from being representational and believable to something more creative. Look how big my brush is on that. So I can kind of steal these. In fact, I might decide I want all my palette reference to be down here, and I can just kind of work between them. Since I'll probably always want my, my form reference there. So all these different ways you can work. Setting up your space is, is pretty important. I also have what's called the Navigator open. And that's something that's just default in Essentials, but the Navigator can be opened under Window. And it has some real advantages as we get into digital painting. For one, it makes it really easy to zoom into areas and uh, to move around without ever having to change your tool. And I like to use it with the brush with the uh, space bar to kind of move around. You can use Command minus to zoom out as well. But what's nice about the Navigator is no matter how zoomed in you are, though I don't want you working on details too closely yet, you'll get to see a small kind of mock-up of it that changes in real time with what you do. Traditional painters will sometimes put a mirror, a little handheld mirror um, next to them on a canvas so that at any time they can just use the mirror and turn and look at it to see their work from a distance, even though it's flipped. And that helps them see the big picture that the navigator gives us. So how your values are coming together, how your edges are coming together. Remember, we don't want to get lost in little details. We want to be working on the whole surface the whole time. So this will be my layer two warm up layer. And I like to do this if I haven't painted in a while. If I was doing this traditionally, I would just use a, a piece of scrap watercolor paper or something. But this allows me to just try some really nutty stuff. What if I throw some of these colors in there? Get used to how the brush works. Get used to how heavy it is. It still has that wet effect on it, which I'm still getting used to. That will give me some texture, which is nice. Now there are some specialized brushes as well. I choose not to go into them too much because this is the basics of, of digital painting that I'm trying to present. But if you wanna see some subtleties of other tools, you can look into some of the older demos and you'll certainly see things like the mixing brush being used. But here I'm just straight painting using my custom brush, but I'm using layers in a, in a way that's more intentional. Now you can see it's nice to have reference from different types of paint as well. This is a much heavier, almost uh, pellet knife painted portrait. And it really pushes 
some of the colors I can get away with. Kind of shows me how they can work, gives me the confidence to bring them into my own palette. Looks more German Expressionist. But by having contrast of, of uh, intense saturated colors, it actually brings out the other colors. And in digital, that never means you have to stick with it that way. So sometimes when I work digitally, I'll paint in very muted tones. Like last semester's demo, I stole my colors from a monochrome painting, you know, mostly grayscale and black and white, some sepia. And then once I had kind of set all the, the grayscale tones and painted it in, then I just really saturated them and found the color that was slightly inherent because there's no such thing in real paint in terms of, um, you know, pure black and white. They always are either a warm black or cool black, warm gray, all of that. Now, even though it looks like I'm drawing with lines in this warm up, in painting, there really are no lines. They're just shapes with different edges that we're trying to control. And that's where the different opacities and different blendings of color come in. And if I'm not getting these wrinkles in the exact right place, that's okay, because their, their edges are going to get painted and repainted each time I, I kind of rework it. So that's why, you know, warming up is important. Just get your confidence, your feel for the brush, the tools, the materials, and your color options. So many. If we wanted it to look just like a photo, we could just rely on the photo. And then once I've done a lot of that, so this is all my warm up, lots of fun colors. You can kind of get a sense of how that's very different than the targeted painting I was doing before, which is feeling a little tight. So I might keep going with the warm up. I can also steal colors still from my source, but my source is more important just for looking with the navigator, seeing where the big shadows are, being my model. I'm going to have more fun with stealing colors from some of these other places. And we've done a pretty good job getting rid of uh, whites, you know, unintentional whites. That's why we change it to a gray background so that anything that I paint white or a version of white is intentional, you know, as a highlight. They can always be modified. You can always push your contrast a little bit. Especially using layers in, a, in an intelligent way. We're not stuck with any one solution. And if your brush has, you know, an angular rotation on it, it will feel pretty fluid. And you can cover a lot of ground quick, quickly without having to worry about it looking overly digital, overly controlled. Now, I'm not worried about the outside edge. I think I need to shave a little bit from his ear, but I'm not going to switch to the eraser tool just yet. And it's going to concentrate within the face more. Some of these greens in there. Find a lighter value. And then, of course, I can always modify whatever colors I choose using swatches or using the color selector here. But I'm still working very much just to augment what I've already painted and to bring it more sharply into finish.
And really what that means is the values, where the dark should be dark and where the light should be light. If you squint, so if I squint, I see that he's darker than I have on the inside of his eyes, which is pretty much always safe. So I can go get away with some darker tones there. Red is a really nice color to use in faces because it's both dark and saturated. Same thing with these deep blues. Still have quite a bit of color to them. And so as I frame the eye, you want to think of the eye as being like a marble that has two drapes drawn over it. And so the width of those drapes is important where they overlap. The colored parts of the eye where highlights are affecting the pupil. All of that matters quite a bit. And communicating where your subject is looking if it's a human creature. And so you have to kind of frame that marble in. Find the edges of the white of the eye. And then the white of the eye is never white. It's quite colored as well. It has shadows, it has blood vessels. But the edge of that width of the eyelid is pretty important. And notice I'm not zooming in on the eye to try to get it just right. Because right now I'm mostly concerned with how everything works together. Seems like the eyebrow should be higher. I'm going to go ahead and paint it in higher. And I'm past relying on my um, basic shapes. I still have them. All right, they're there. But I should be able to kind of see what's working and what's not in adjusting. Again, we're not trying to match the photograph so much as do our own interpretation, our own painting. And then I also noticed by squinting that the jaw, you know, his kind of five o'clock shadow, the shadows underneath his lips. Indeed, his lips are a lot darker than I've painted so far. And it's great because I'm, I'm on a different layer, you know, that shows me everything I've just warmed up with. And now I'm feeling more warmed up. So I'm going to keep this as a guide. And maybe go to my targeted painting again, which was underneath, and start painting on that. now knowing, forcing myself to be a little bit more adventurous with my color selections, because I'm painting behind them now. So you, using layers in this really experimental way allows you to try new things. So now I'm painting behind certain paint layers and on top of others. And it's just getting closer and closer. And then I'll do refined paint on top of all of it. And use those top layers to make all my final decisions. And that's where I'll use kind of the, the lower opacity, maybe to blend. Depends on what finish I'm going for. and maybe zoom around and do some more targeted approaches. Because this might like good, look good from a distance, but when I am, um, you know, it's shaping up okay there. It's looking very clownish, which I'll fix. But then when I print it, it's gonna be all about seeing it up close. Seeing if those textures and everything hold up. I remember a nice shortcut for fitting it all on the screen. Command O will fit it right within your window. All right.
So my warm-up layer is 